you have the pleasure of introducing our speaker today, Terry Williams. And I have to say that I heard um, an earlier version of the presentation that Terry is going to give us to a different group about six months ago, and I found it so riveting and disturbing, but also a lot of hope in it as well, that I, I knew when I heard her that I, I was really hoping that she would come to our club and speak. So I say earlier version because as she told me at our table, the topic is changing constantly and she's always adding new information to her presentation, so I look forward to hearing the updates also. So without further ado, Terry Williams is Vice President of the Women's Foundation of Minnesota, and as you'll see from her passion when she speaks to us today, she considers her work at the foundation to be a calling rather than a job. Before joining the Women's Foundation, Terry served as the Director of Community Affairs and Philanthropy for Ameriprise Financial for 12 years. And in that role, she led a team in launching a strategic community relations program, increased employee participation in the annual giving campaign from 1 million to 2.2 million, and championed employee volunteer participation for Habitat for Humanity. In 2007, Terry left Ameriprise to co-found Forward Motion Travel, a travel company that mixes vacation with philanthropy and community service, something near and dear to Rotarians' hearts. And earlier in her career, Terry worked in corporate sales. Terry is an active contributor to the health and vitality of the Twin Cities community. She was a founding member of Equality Minnesota, a nonpartisan organization formed to protect the rights of same-sex couples in the state of Minnesota. She also served on the Women's Foundation of Minnesota Board of Trustees, where she was board chair for two years and chair of the Girls Best Committee for five years. Terry is currently co-chair of the Stewardship Committee of St. Paul's Episcopal Church in Minneapolis. Terry holds a Bachelor of Science with distinction from the University of Minnesota. Please join me in welcoming Terry Williams. Thank you, Andrea, for that very kind introduction. And I hope that I am as riveting as you described me being, because uh, it's the day after Thanksgiving, and I shared with my table mates that we're getting our house ready to put on the market. And so I've spent the last four or five days lifting boxes and decluttering and things that happen after 15 years in a home, as I'm sure you all can appreciate. So. I want to start out by asking how many of you have ever heard of the Women's Foundation of Minnesota? Okay, so a few of you, many many of the women in the room and a couple of, of men in the room. Um, I have to do a shout out to Don Stiles because his wife Leslie and her sister Karen have been longtime supporters of the Women's Foundation and some of the work that we're doing, especially around um, our Girls Best and now our Minnesota Girls Are Not For Sale campaign. For those of you who are not familiar with the Women's Foundation, we are a social change philanthropy and we actually fund, um, we do research, we do convening, we do grant making, and we do most of our work in the state of Minnesota. We fund in four areas and I actually wanna do a shout out to Rotary and Steve to the presentation that you made about water rights because I think that when you think about women's issues and girls' issues in terms of issues like water rights, and you shared what you saw when you were in Honduras and in Africa, um, what we know is that safety and security is a huge issue for women when they go out to get the water. We know that women's health is a huge issue when they don't have clean water. We know that economic opportunity can really help women to thrive in these developing countries, and we also know that leadership of women can actually raise up communities. And so the Women's Foundation in Minnesota actually funds in those four areas. So we're doing the same thing at a local level to really raise women up. Now the safety and security area is really where, this keeps moving on me. Safety and security is really where we started to um, find out that we needed to do something about this issue of sex trafficking. So Minneapolis City Attorney Susan Siegel came or called our president Lee Roper Badker into our office and said, we are seeing an alarming number of girls, many young, young girls coming before our bench and actually being treated as criminals. So they were trying to prosecute these kids that were being picked up for prostitution. Um, we also then funded research with one of our grantee partners, the Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center called Shattered Hearts, and it really documented the trafficking of Native American girls on the ships in the Duluth Harbor. And so we suddenly started to see a picture of what was happening with trafficking of children in the state of Minnesota. When Lee met with Susan, she said, what's the Women's Foundation going to do about this? And that was kind of a big order back in 2006, 2007. 
Okay, so, um, so it was brought to our attention and we basically realized that we had to do something. We had to take action on the issue. We uh, brought together a group of advocates, law enforcement, elected officials, faith communities, and we met to say, what can Minnesota's response to this issue be? And so the Minnesota Girls Are Not For Sale campaign was born out of that. There are brochures that are on the tables, I believe. Were those all passed out? So you can take one of those, one of those with you. Um, in the summer of 2010, and I want to try to stay to, with my script and move through this because I really want to open it up to questions and answers because that's a really rich part of this presentation. Uh, in the summer, we convened the 85 stakeholders and we created the campaign out of that. Again, Minnesota Girls Are Not For Sale. It's a five-year, $5 million campaign and basically it has three goals. So the first is we need to decriminalize the kids who are being picked up for trafficking. Second, we need to decrease demand and increase resources to law enforcement so that they can actually have some impact when they pick up um, the buyers and the sellers of children. And then we need to raise awareness and engage the public in this issue. I'm happy to say that the brochure that you see in front of you, we had 10,000 printed in our first run. We ran out of those 10,000 brochures and we now are in our second run of that. So I think that public education piece is really happening. Um, how many of you saw the article, four-part series in the Minneapolis Star Tribune, Saving Bobby? Wow, fabulous. Um, that's another way that we've really worked on public education. The reporter that wrote that article actually met with us about a year ago, and we introduced her to Sergeant Grant Snyder. And so she really said, what do we need if we're going to move the needle on this? And we really needed the voices of survivors. And so the young woman from Two Harbors who came to to uh, be interviewed for that series was actually someone, as you read, um, that Grant Snyder was working with and, and rescued. Um, I have to report that we've been in contact, the reporter has been in contact with Bobby every day and she's just getting an outpouring of well wishes. So she's actually doing really, really well and is getting a lot of support right now. So in many ways, the movement to end sex trafficking is a lot like the domestic violence movement 30 years ago. And back then, if somebody reported that they were being abused, everyone would kind of say, yeah, right, but it's not our issue. It's something that happens in the home behind closed doors. There wasn't really a response to deal with domestic violence, but really Minnesota came through and we built what's been known as the Minnesota model to combat domestic violence. And it's the model that's being used nationally. So what we decided to do is to actually do a similar thing with sex trafficking of children. And while some states have had success in building a model to combat sex trafficking, no one has come up with a strategic model that can really address the issues. So what we have are basically lack of housing. So when an officer picks a kid up on the street at 3 o'clock in the morning because they're being sold, there's no place to bring them. A Sergeant John Bandemer from the St. Paul Police Department with the Vic Task Force has told us that he's picked up kids and basically had to bring them to juvenile detention because there's no place to put them. State of Minnesota has two beds, two beds for kids who've been trafficked, sex trafficked, and they've increased it to four beds. So basically four beds across the state for children who've been trafficked. And the challenge we have is that the kids who are being sex trafficked are often brought into the life when their average age is 13 years, sometimes as young as 11. And the kids basically are stuck at that age after they've been trafficked. So we need not just housing, but we need services, we need trauma treatment, we need everything that goes with it. So you can't just take a kid and put him into a homeless shelter uh, because they often recruit other kids from the shelters, if we do that, there's huge safety concerns about the pimp coming to try and get the kid back into the system. As, as a side note, sex trafficking or the sale of sex, and this is true of children and women, is the second most lucrative illegal activity after the sale of drugs. So it's drugs, it's selling sex or human trafficking, and then um, weapons or guns. Huge industry. Um, so. So where are we at with our campaign and our goal? We're in the third year of the campaign. Um, we have given out about $3 million towards the issue, and that includes initial research that we did with the Melman Group out of Washington, D.C., to really look at what is public um, attitude about the issue. We have actually convened partners every year. We bring together all of these core people, and we have done research and grant making to try and get law enforcement up to speed. So for the 
First time ever we've funded public, uh, public agencies, the Minneapolis and St. Paul Police Departments, and Grant Snyder actually is one of our grantee partners, Officer Snyder. Um, we were able to provide them a device that actually scrambles cell phone numbers, and so when they pick somebody up who's been selling a child, or they pick up the child, they can immediately put this phone into a system and find out what the common calls are before they can erase it. So it's been a huge, huge tool for law enforcement to use in order to actually connect with the traffickers. Um, we've done hotel training has been created to train every single hotel worker in Ramsey County, um, the Mall of America has been a huge partner. Shout out to the work that they've been doing early on in training their security folks. So for instance, the Days Inn in Roseville, um, about a year and a half ago, a young girl came in with an older man and the hotel clerk got suspicious because she wasn't talking to him, he wasn't allowing her to talk. Um, she was rather disheveled. And so the, uh, the clerk called the Roseville Police Department the police department came, they went into the room, and they actually discovered that it was a 17-year-old girl that had been trafficked by this gentleman. Um, the Minneapolis and St. Paul police were able to help the Roseville police to have this girl start to talk to them, and in fact, she had been trafficking or trafficked. Uh, they were able to prosecute this gentleman, Samuel Kozar, and uh, Ramsey County Attorney John Choi, and he received a 21-year sentence. So we're starting to really see some, some inroads and some progress in, in the work that's happening. Um, so we passed Safe Harbor Law, 2011. Uh, who knows what Safe Harbor Law is? A Couple of folks, you heard about it, Andrea, so. Safe Harbor is actually legislation that was crafted and created a system where basically children who are being trafficked will no longer be criminalized. They'll be treated as victims of a crime. And I'm excited to say that in 2012, we bought a, brought a delegation to Washington, D.C. to meet with our senators and representatives. And Senator Klobuchar last week introduced a safe harbor legislation that's going to be a national uh, legislation. And it's based on the Minnesota model for safe harbor. What she's also done is to put some, um, some legs to it because states that don't um, that don't actually use safe harbor, they'll withhold some federal funding for other projects. So she's actually building a really good good model. So what we also then, when, when safe harbor passed, it mandated that the legislation come up with a housing and treatment services, a plan for housing and treatment services. So that plan's been created, it's called No Wrong Door, and it means that any kid who is either picked up um, any kid who is, might be suspected of being trafficked through the bus system, um, through the Mall of America, wherever, someone could call a navigator and get that kid into the system, and not the law system, but um, housing, treatment, et cetera. So we put together a plan that would add 50 beds to the four beds that we currently have, and we went to the legislation and asked them for $13.5 million. Well we got 2.8, so we called it an underfunded success, and we're now planning on going back to the legislation to try and get it fully funded. So what the 2.8 million is gonna do, a one million will go to housing, so we're gonna um, be adding 18 beds to the four that currently exist. One million is going towards, I'm forgetting what the next million is going for. 800,000 is going for training of law enforcement. So we know that the metro area law enforcement really get what's going on, but we really need to get out to greater Minnesota and start to change the ideology and how law enforcement think about these kids that have been picked up. And one million is going to create the staffing that they need. So there's gonna be a statewide director and then these navigators around the state. Um, what we know and what we're hearing from law enforcement is that the number one question that our Minneapolis and St. Paul police officers get asked by greater Minnesota police departments is, what do we do because we know that it's happening? And if you recall, Bobby was actually from Two Harbors, Minnesota. So we know it's happening across the state. We know that, um, for instance, they're using Jefferson bus lines sometimes to move the kids from Duluth to Minneapolis and then down to Chicago and over to North Dakota. So Jefferson bus lines proactively contacted us and said, we suspect this is going on, what can we do about it? So Grant Snyder is going to actually be doing focus groups with the um, ticketing agents and the drivers so that he can 
help them to see what are the signs to look for, a large number of kids that are being moved by an adult. Um, if, if they can get video footage, they can actually show the police who they think might be moving the kids and then um, basically see if it's somebody that they identify from another ring. So really, really exciting things are happening in this movement. Um, I think it's why at the Women's Foundation we talk about holding out hope because people that are so unlikely have come together on this issue. Um, really, really exciting. We have the state director in place. Lauren Ryan just came from the International Center, and so she is in place and is now going to be building um, the model with the $2.8 million. So what are we going to do next at the Women's Foundation? Our game plan is, remains the same. We're going to ensure that Safe Harbor is fully funded. So we need to go back to the legislation and really say that we need the full $13.5 million if we're going to create a sustainable model. We're going to offer uh, evaluation, collaborative evaluation, so that the state can see if the 18 beds that are being built really are viable and if it's enough, if it's too many. We don't think it's going to be too many. We know that on any given night, uh, 212 kids are being trafficked in, in the metro area. And then we really need to look at issues of data privacy, huge issues with data privacy when you're under 18 years. And so how do we kind of shift, shift the um, laws? And we're working with the, with the state departments to really look at data privacy. And then finally, we are going to look at um, how do we really increase penalties? How do we really start to go after the demand? Because we know that as long as there is a market for buying and selling sex, as long as we have buyers and we have sellers, and as long as it's a lucrative business, how do we go after that demand side? So we're really looking at um, ways that we can that we can increase penalties for not just the sellers but also for the people that are buying um, and I think that's going to be a huge issue and it's the issue that people are really asking us about now um, on November 18th two weeks ago we held a housing conference which was fascinating because we were able to bring in national partners from across the country that are doing housing and treatment services and they shared some of their models so that we can build the Minnesota model that will hopefully roll out um, nationally. And then we also were able to hear from uh, Ambassador Luis de Baca, who's with Homeland Security, and his specialty is trafficking in human beings. And he really um, met with the legislative body and pushed that our, our uh, legislative body needs to have political courage because it's not an issue that people are necessarily interested in. It's still something that's behind closed doors. So how do they have the kind of courage to step up and, and do the right thing for this? So we're feeling hopeful that that will happen. I think that, um, that child sex trafficking is one of humanity's greatest tragedies. And I think that it is a human rights violation. Um, we believe that prostitution of women is an act of violence against women. Um, Vanita Carter from Breaking Free, she's one of the um, first agencies that started doing this work many years ago. They're survivor-led, and she has really set the tone that, that prostitution is an act of violence against women. So how do we start to have those kinds of discussions? Um, we continue to get into the schools. We continue to see boys um, really getting actively engaged in the issue, which is very exciting for us. So I think at this point, I want to just go ahead and open it up to questions, discussion, um, comments. And we have questions starting right back. What is the current penalty for buyers and sellers? Um, the current penalty for buyers and sellers really varies. We had a case, and Samuel Kozar got 21 years because he had some other incredibly violent um, and violent rests on his record. Um, the Washington ring that was just broken up in St. Paul was actually the result of the grant that we made to the St. Paul Police Department. And they prosecuted that last week, and I don't know that they've actually gotten the full sentence. But you know, you're looking at anywhere from five years to 21 years for selling. For buyers, um, we just had a case in, perhaps Chanhassen it was, a couple of weeks ago, where the girls were arrested, or young women were arrested, and they basically just sent the buyers on their way. So it's, it's, I think that's the challenge, is that we have to make it not okay for law enforcement to not prosecute um, the buyers. Yes? Um, girls were being trafficked 
are, can be picked up for quite a number of different things when they're not actively engaged in prostitution. Right. And what, what are you doing to make sure that the prosecutors across the state are motivated to give up the possibility of conviction, which, which is their business, and refer a girl into an alternative purity? Did everyone hear the question? Yeah, no? Okay, the question basically is what are we doing to, with prosecutors across the state so that rather than picking up a kid for an, something that may not be evidently prostitution related, what are we doing to educate prosecutors about getting the kids into the treatment that they need rather than, than penalizing them? Um, Ramsey County Attorney John Choi, I don't know if any of you know the Ramsey County Attorney, but he has been a fearless, tireless leader on this issue. And so he has really been the first one out in the metro area to say that, that if kids are picked up for anything that appears to be like a prostitu prostitution related cause or case, that they will not be um, brought into the criminal justice system, that they will be treated as victims of a crime. They're creating a toolkit, a training toolkit that they are going to be rolling out across the state to train prosecutors and to train the police departments. And that's part of the grant also. So we said that we really need to have a, a blueprint for safety that will be consistently used. So Olmstead County is now going to be using it. St. Louis County is going to be using it. Um, Ramsey, Hennepin counties. So I think we're starting to really push that out. Way in the back. In terms of... Uh just kind of the statistics you're seeing um, with victims of the crime of prostitution. <coughs> what are you seeing in the undocumented community amongst uh, young women? Are you seeing that it's <coughs> one way or the other more prevalent, less prevalent, or not necessarily in particular trend there yet? Um, we are looking, this, this campaign really started out, um, out of looking at domestically trafficked kids because what we know or what the statistics show us is that about 83% of children who are trafficked in Minnesota are actually domestic, domestically born. Um, because I think the challenge with that is that we would have people say to us, well, that's something that happens in Thailand or that happens with you know, kids that are coming over from these other countries. And so we really had to work at, at looking at what the reality of that number is. Um, we know from the Latina community that it's an issue because people are afraid to, to come out or come forward with it. We know that there's issues within the Hmong community. So we're now starting to really look at the culturally specific programming to find out what do we need to do um, to make sure that those kids aren't falling through the cracks. And we do a lot of funding at the Women's Foundation in those communities um, to begin with. We do a lot of funding um, within diverse communities. That's one of the values as a foundation that we hold. I have kind of a two-part question. Um, wondering if you can touch on summer activity versus inner city, because um, Red Roof, of course, notorious in Woodbury, had problems for years, I think. And I think it was the Hilton Garden in Roseville. You know, and I think sometimes all of us probably live in a suburb, most of us, and we kind of think, well, that doesn't really happen here. So kind of touching on that a little bit. And then of those particular institutions, was it a matter of educating people that work there? Or was it that they had like some bad characters running the places? Yeah, good question. So the question is suburban activity and then, uh, and then the education of people, or was it bad characters or did people start to become aware? Um, I think that kids who are trafficked are kids who are vulnerable and you know, predators know how to find their prey and we all know children who are vulnerable. The young woman that was from Two Harbors um, actually suffered from fetal alcohol syndrome. Um, and a friend of mine who is executive director of ARC said that it's a real issue in communities with developmental disabilities because children who are more vulnerable can be preyed upon. But I think that it really is about, you know, we had a case, a Minnetonka girl that was um, trafficked. She was arrested 30 times, something like that. She was finally um, picked up in Florida when she was in her 30s. And she had been trafficked out of Minnetonka High School when she was 15, 16 years old. Um, every privilege in the world. Her folks, she had been raised in England. She moved back. Uh, she had an accent. She dressed different. And she was basically bullied at school. And so a 36-year-old man befriended her. 
um, started to take her out, and, you know, did the dating thing, that whole story, and then started to traffic her. And I think that we hear often that that's what happens, is that you know these young kids um, fall prey to these older men who are very smooth and, and very slick, and I don't, don't fit the model that I think we all have about what a trafficker might look like. So I think that we're seeing it certainly in communities of color. There's a dis, uh, disproportionate number in terms of poverty and some of those factors, but vulnerability is also a key factor. Um, and many children at 11 and 12 and 13 are vulnerable. So I think that's one issue. The hotel workers really has been the result of this training. Um, Radisson Hotels is another one, and Marilyn Carlson Nelson has been a tireless, tireless advocate on this issue. And they train every single employee, hotel employee in the company across the globe on how to spot signs of trafficking. Um, I was at a, in Cambodia, I was at a hotel recently, and they actually had a pamphlet, if you think somebody's being trafficked, here's what to do. So I think hotels are really starting to get very involved because they know that that's a source. Um, the challenge is the internet has made this really hard because right now there's anonymity. There was one report that uh, John reported that you can get a girl quicker than you can get a pizza delivered to your room. So the internet has made this really a tough, a tough thing to, to track. Um, and so we're really looking at that. But I think education is huge. Um, Sergeant Snyder shared with, with us um, at one of our meetings that one of the arrests they made, they talked to the neighbors afterwards. It was at a house in Minneapolis. And they talked to the neighbors after and interviewed them. And every single neighbor said, well, we kind of thought something was odd there. We saw a lot of traffic coming in and out. He said not one person called the police. So, you know, they're really telling us, if you suspect anything, call 911. Because if you really think about it, and when you look at these cases and you step back, you start to realize that there probably was something going on. So awareness. I know there's a hand over here that's been up for a while. Um, <coughs> my first <coughs> this whole concept was that movie Taken. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure you've seen it. Um, it was probably like the most sickening movie I've ever seen in my life. I kind of felt too because it was supposed to be an action movie, but it was, not, it was more like a documentary. I think. Um, but it was so extreme. Like they were kidnapping people and drug inducing you know, them, and there was almost like these sex factories, if you will. Um, is that type of extremism happening here in Minnesota? And, and have you guys seen situations like that where they're actually inducing these kids with drugs and they just are going to deal with going on? Um, anecdotally, we've heard that. What we do know is that once kids are, are brought into the life, that drugs are a huge part of it. So that becomes part of the treatment is that once they, once they get into that cycle, um, drugs become a really big part of it. And so there are these drug-induced um, drug-induced stupors, if you will. Um, and I think in the Saving Bob Bobby article, they talked about that, that she was addicted to meth, I believe. So it's a really good series if you haven't read it. Um, I think the other challenge that we have, though, is that often when you pick up one of a, a, a child, a girl or a boy who's who's been prostituted, they won't necessarily say, oh, I'm being prostituted, because they may say, it's my boyfriend, you know, he loves me, he takes care of me. Um, and so there's a whole brainwashing that goes on with these kids once they have been brought into the life. And so part of the treatment is that you have to have chemical dependency, you have to have the trauma treatment, because it's so incredibly violent, what, what happens in order to brainwash someone. Um, and so I think that there is some of that kind of snatching off, but I think it is much more of that vulnerability and then that brainwashing that happens. Uh, what we know from some research that was conducted by another group is that a kid who's been trafficked suffers from the same level of post-traumatic stress as an active combat vet. Um, so post-traumatic stress is just off the Richter scale with, with these kids and, and young women. What, how about security of these of the housing that you developed? So hopefully, that will grow. You have to establish some sort of security. Yeah, the question is around security, and there are different models around the country in terms of security. So the housing, and someone asked about it, the 180 degrees in St. Paul has just announced that they're breaking grounds for a housing center in St. Paul. Um, they're going to use something interesting in that there'll be a delay. So if a kid gets to the door and presses the button to, or the door panel to run, there'll be a 10-second delay 
so that the staff has a chance to get there to talk to the kid. Um, obviously, if they want to go, they can still go. But so there's there's that security for the child, but then there's also the security of how do you transport um, how do you transport people who are going into housing. Um, sometimes it will need to be police escort. Um, security is a huge issue, which is why you can't just take an existing housing shelter and drop a kid into it who's been trafficked. That's a big issue. It's kind of continuing with that thought you mentioned that Prince will sometimes try to get them back into the business. <coughs> Ongoing treatment and ongoing monitoring or counseling do you guys provide or see working so that that doesn't happen? Yeah, um, we actually fund the work. So we don't do any of the treatment or anything ourselves because we're a foundation and so we're kind of the glue that's bringing all of this work together and we have got phenomenal partners in Minnesota doing the work. Uh, so treatment, ongoing treatment is critical and and keeping the kids safe is critical and keeping the kids, um, because they do go back and the pimps are very are very good at bringing them back in and so it's not it's it's it you're in it for the long haul and and last week at this housing conference every single expert every single psychologist that talked said you can't just like pick up the kid and say okay we're done because you could take three steps back and one step forward and so it really is a long haul issue um, I know one woman who was has 31 arrests on her record and finally for whatever reason, that 30-second arrest is when she said, I'm done. And Grant Snyder talks about that, which is you know, why he gives his cards out so that when a kid calls him in the middle of the night, maybe after the 20th or 30th arrest, um, and says, okay, I, I, I want to be out of this, that, that he can do that. Right here. I, I was just curious about something. It's kind of a broad question, but uh, in terms of the, the people that are wanting the sex, um, do you have any observations about demographics? And sort of early in your talk, you were talking about domestic <coughs> violence and how I think when we think about that historically, people have had feelings of entitlement around women. Do you find or that many of the men who purchase sex have justifications that somehow this is victimless or I know in the article, Grant Snyder talked about the Minnesota nice guys feel that somehow they were helping women by, I, you know, do you have any comments about that? Right. It's about the profile of the person who's buying sex is the question. Um, a couple of things, and one is that, and this is a, a personal thing, that I went to, uh, Breaking Free has a John school, and so for men who've been picked up, you can actually go to this day-long Saturday session, and you, if you're, if you're good for a year and you, um, and you, aren't picked up for, for purchasing, then your record can be expunged or can be taken off your record. So you're on probation. There were 13 men there. I was stunned that every one of them was married. Uh, most, I think almost all of them were either from a suburb or from greater Minnesota. They all had children or grandchildren. They were all professionals. And so it just kind of, it, it, it amazed me, but I think it, by the end of the day, they realized that it was not a victimless crime. So I think going into it, there was this thought that, that it was victimless, and by the end of the day, we had men that were crying and going to breaking free and saying, what can we do to help? We, we, we didn't realize. So I think that, that that we need to educate, I think, was what needs to happen. One more question? I was wondering if you want to touch just a little bit on the 35W core. On the what? 35W okay. corridor. Question about the 35W corridor. Um, it is a corridor, and it actually serves as a reason, they think, there's speculation that the reason that um, that the Twin Cities or that Minnesota is, is ranked in one of the top 13 by the FBI for children being trafficked, and if you didn't know that, one of the top 13 in the country. We used to, They used to say one or two, but they couldn't collaborate corroborate that statistic. Um, but so 35W is a corridor that goes all the way down to Texas so that they can move kids down to Texas. Um, we know that there have been cases at the truck stops where kids are being trafficked in the, on 35W truck stops. Um, and so it makes it very easy to move, to move the, uh, the product, if you will. That is it. Thank you very much. I do. Yes. Thank you very much, Terry. As a token of our appreciation, and thank, thank you, you Rotary Thank you so much for joining us today.